Welcome to this week's program. My guest is Rachel Heffer, Director of Mission at the Evangelical Alliance. Rachel, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Great to be here with you, J. John. I want to start with some of your hobbies. Well, you like travel. I love travel. Yeah. You like languages. I do love languages. That was you, my degree. And you like shoes. I love shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, let's start How with the shoes. How do you know this about me? <laughs> let's start with the shoes. Well, shoes, I think art is different to different people, isn't it? And I have to say, for me, for anyone that knows me, shoes are like art. So they tend to have a ridiculously high heel sometimes. Yes. Um, I've been mocked many times, even walking through many streets of London with high heels. But you should see my bedroom at home. There are many pairs of shoes, many of them gathering dust, many. but a beautiful um, array of shoes, which to me are like art. <laughs> Rachel, what's your journey of faith? Have you always known the Lord? Mm. The short answer to that would probably be yes. Yeah, I grew up in a family with very strong Christian parents, um, a brother who's a couple of years younger than me. Um, and yeah, we were always church goers. I was very fortunate growing up in inner city Leicester to be in a church that was amazing in terms of its children's ministry and then as a teenager, its youth ministry. Um, but the crux for me came at the age of seven. That was when I became a Christian and made that decision for myself. Um, it was at a summer holiday club. I don't remember exactly what clinched the deal, so to speak, um, apart from being that age. And as a seven year old girl, friendships being a bit in and out, you know, up and down and so on. And just knowing that Jesus was my best friend in the midst of that. It was a summer holiday club and that's when I became a Christian. Um, yeah. yeah. So as you look back now, you, I mean, you can remember there was a moment mm -hmm. Uh, because we often talk about evangelism uh, as a process and a crisis. And obviously for you, there was that moment when you were born again or you received Christ and you remember it. I do. And I've often thought, I wish I remembered the person who sat on those stairs just outside of the main room of that holiday club and quite simply prayed a few simple words. Because actually, even at age seven, that was transformative in my life. Um, so, yes, absolutely. It became a very real moment in time for me. And what that went on to was at the age of 14, um, I was in an Anglican church and I was confirmed. And that was a really significant moment that for some of my friends, it was a bit of a tick box, a kind of rite of passage. This is what we do. But for me at 14, it was very much a kind of thanks, mum and dad. This is actually something I really do want to take on for myself. So that, again, age seven and then at 14 was a real sort of clincher for me in sort of, I guess, even more at 14, taking that on, having teased out some of the questions and, and so on to actually say, this is what I want now for my life. And, and actually, some of those church traditions um, are good. I mean, we know that some traditions actually can hinder rather than help, but actually uh, the tradition in the Anglican Church of Confirmation, it, it's almost like inking in what you've penciled in, mm, isn't it? Absolutely. And it's a real public affirmation, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it was for me, certainly. Like I said, for some of the friends I'd grown up with age 13, 14, yeah. I saw for them it wasn't that meaningful. Um, some of them have continued in faith, others have fallen away. Um, but for me, it really was a moment in time where it was exactly as you said there, just that moment of actually yes. declaration to myself, to the wider church, to those who were there to support me um, and to my mum and dad to just say, you know, thanks so much for all that you've shared and taught me. In, but now, actually, this is something that I want to grab hold of for myself. And thankfully, going into my later teenage years, you know, whilst it came with all the ups and downs and trials and tribulations and the fun stuff that comes with teenage years. But I never swayed far away from that being grounded and rooted in the church and growing in my faith during that time and very grateful to many in our youth ministry and so on who at the time poured their lives into me and the wider youth group um, yeah and I've gone on to invest myself in many years of youth ministry um, since then being passionate about how transformative that age and stage of life can be for so many as it was for me yeah absolutely and, and as you said uh, you were involved in 
a lot of youth ministry. Um, you joined British Youth for Christ. Mm -hmm. And what did you do there? Because were you with them for about 13 years? Yeah, 13 years all in. Yeah, which is hilarious when I think back to my very first interview with Youth for Christ, which was working with one of our local centres at the time. And even in my interview, having come out of doing my language degree and loving travel, I said, you know, well, I'd probably be here for a year or two. Um, that ended up being three and a half years and then a f um, with the local centre and then a further 10 years with British Youth for Christ, five of those years being part of the leadership team. So I've said to many young people since, it's good to plan your way, but hold your plans very lightly because clearly Absolutely. God had very uh, different plans. But yeah, I moved down to the area where I now live, which is Ely in Cambridgeshire, and became very invested in the life of Youth for Christ, but also the church partnerships, the schools, the youth ministry. Um, and again, my part of my initial role there was taking the good news of the gospel appropriately into the school context, into running Alpha courses and so on and so forth. Um, and then the 10 years working with British Youth for Christ nationally was working, again, developing resources for evangelism, um, growing teams, and as I said, part of the leadership team in the five years um, up to about 2014 when I moved on. So, yeah, Yeah, and privilege. then you moved on, but now you're with the Evangelical Alliance. Right. Who is the Evangelical Alliance? Mm. So the Evangelical Alliance is a unity movement. We were birthed right back in 1846, so that makes us about, what, 176 or so years old. Um, and um, as a unity movement, we basically seek to uh, serve and equip the church and, as I said, champion church leaders, but in lots of different areas. Um, so we have an advocacy team who speak into the corridors of power, so to speak, and any sort of Christian bills um, that are coming out or where we need to have a voice in areas of whether it's conversion therapy or gender or ethnicity or education, then we're right in the, in the forefront there of advocating for the evangelical church in that area. My role as head of mission is very much to string together um, those across our offices in both in England and Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland. Again, just looking to really discern where through our member organisations and individuals um, and church leaders best need us to listen, to be discerning, to be equipping and championing of them. Um, um, in all areas of mission and evangelism. So, so that's what we seek to do as the EA, is very much to, um, as I said, be serving and supporting, but very much to have that voice as well on behalf of the evangelical church um, to see where, again, things need reshaping or speaking into at this um, current context and against the con current cultural backdrop, which is sometimes Absolutely. challenging. It is imagine. challenging. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm a member of the Evangelical Alliance. I support it, <laughs> and uh, and I think we need more people to support it and become members, and that's very important. Well, amongst many things that you do, um, one is this: it's Talking Jesus report. I read this report, Rachel, when it first came out, um, and I have subsequently read it actually many, many times. Um, right, tell us, first of all, uh, what prompted this report to come together? Mm. Well, this report that you've got there was launched at the back end of April last year, um, 2022, but it wasn't actually the first time that the Talking Jesus research has come about, as you may know. So where it came from was actually 2015, when a bunch of leaders called the Denominational Leaders Summit, so heads of networks, heads of um, denominations and so on, basically said, wouldn't it be great if rather than just anecdotally, we actually knew through some um, credible piece of research actually what non-Christians across the UK reflect on any Christians that they know or indeed on what they might reflect of the church. But we also wanted to know, back in 2015 this was, um, as I said, that actually, you know, how do Christians feel about sharing their faith as well? So a piece of research, the original Talking Jesus research was done back in 2015, and that really served to actually really equip many churches, it seems, who've told us through engaging in the Talking Jesus course and other things since, that it really helped shape their mission and um, evangelism strategies. So the dream was always to map the UK landscape in 2015 and go again in five years' time so that we could compare and contrast but obviously if you go 2015 add five sure. takes us to 2020 obviously we didn't see incoming a global pandemic so we paused so what's come out of that gap of now seven years is this piece of research which again looks to 
against the backdrop of COVID as well now, be a six-way partnership with ourselves yes. um, and numerous other um, partners within it, as I said, but to really map the UK landscape in terms of faith again. So to look at the state of faith across the UK and really the dream behind it is, is that it would equip people to not only see what maybe, as Christian witnesses, what our Christian friends think of us, what they think of the church, but also how we can gain confidence in sharing Jesus in this time and season now. Now, you interviewed 4,000 people. Um, I'm just curious, okay, how did you find those 4,000 people? Right. Well, we went to Savannah Comres. That was the research body who have that network of people. So they listened to us, what we wanted, and we went out to people across all regions of the UK, across gender, across, across ethnicity, um, and they took that sweep of people. But we added in a boost sample of about 917 practising Christians. So therefore... Um uh, 3,000 unchurched people. Yes, yeah. Uh, um, uh, no, so within that mix, the, yeah, the boost sample of 917. So that gave us a, yeah, that all in was 4,000. Yes, all together. Right. Okay, right. So um, what people in the UK think of Jesus, Christians and evangelism? Okay, what do people think about Jesus? Well, we asked that very question. One of the questions that we launched with when at 28th of April last year, we went live with the research, we put out the report and so on. And we asked people across the UK, if you think of the person of Jesus, who would you say he is? And what we found was that whilst I think it was 31% of people said that they believed that Jesus was a good man, a spiritual leader, but not God, what we did find is that 20% of the UK think that Jesus is God. So that's quite significant, isn't it? One in five people amongst our friendship groups or our spheres of influence would say that Jesus is God. So, so let me just ask you one other question. So mm. what is the percentage in the UK currently uh, that call themselves Christians? So 48% of people would say that they would tick a box to say that they would affiliate to being a Christian. If we break that down, those by our definition of practicing Christian is 6%. And by that, that's people who would tick the box to say that they would go to church at least monthly, but read the Bible and pray at least weekly. So, so 6% mm -hmm. uh, belong to a church. That's right. But you said that 20% believe that Jesus Christ... Yeah is God. Yes, absolutely. So that's incredible, really. Well, it shows, doesn't it, that actually people in our midst, whilst they may not affiliate to being a Christian, may not certainly be a practicing Christian, therefore, you know, belonging to a worshiping community, but actually they have this sense of Jesus being an important person to get to know something about. And we went on to ask them about, OK, whatever you think of Jesus, what about the resurrection? Yes. Again, it came out near Easter time and so on. And what we found that whilst 41 percent of people said, no, nope, don't believe in the resurrection, a whopping great 45% of the UK said, yes, I believe in the resurrection. Whether that was word for word, exactly as the Bible tells it, or with a bit of, um, you know, they weren't quite so sure. So 29% of people said they believe in the resurrection, maybe not exactly as the Bible said, but 16% of people said that they absolutely believe the word of God, just as it's um, told. And so overridingly, 45% of the UK believe in the resurrection, which again, going back to the 6% of Christians, but 45% of people have that sense of there's something more to find out here. So we were really encouraged by some but of those. That's very encouraging. Out. What mm. about when it comes to the Bible? Well, what's fascinated us about the report of what comes out about the Bible um, is that when we ask the question of if you to our non-Christian friends, if you to eat, were to even look to explore the Christian faith, where would you go? The top answer was actually maybe unsurprising was Google. Yes. Don't know about you. I go to Google for anything. Wow. You know, whether it's research or a holiday or shopping. Sure. And actually, we found um, that that was really interesting. Thought that 26% of people wanting to explore faith said that they would go to Google first. Further 10% said they'd go to YouTube. So 36% would explore the online presence, which speaks to me about a bit of the safety net, maybe the anonymity, being able to ask those big questions. But coming back to the Bible, that was our second top answer. So if people said they wanted to explore faith, 22% of the UK said that they would go to the Bible first, which I find fascinating and Very challenging. Fascinating. And a lot of leaders, as we've been speaking about this and presenting on it myself and others across the partnership, a number of leaders have said to me, Rachel, is it really bad that I'm surprised that that is quite so high that people would actually pick up the Bible or go to a digital version? 
And my response has been, no, it's not bad to be surprised, but no. isn't it a timely reminder for us in this day and age against the reeling cultural backdrop that actually getting the word of God into people's hands, digitally or otherwise, and actually the transformative word of God is having a credible impact Absolutely. in people's lives. So the Bible comes through very strongly and is critical in our practicing Christians as to how they would account for coming to faith as well. And the Bible, after a life crisis, or a life event, the Bible is a second half answer second. there too. But w what's interesting about that, Rachel, I find I was a student in London uh, in 1974, agnostic, mm. met a Christian, he gave me a Bible. Mm. And in those days, that would have been very common to do. Yeah. And he met with me every week yeah. and taught me the Bible. Mm. And, and basically, I, reading through John's gospel yes. uh, led me to Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And, we're all, and we're always a little bit reluctant, aren't we, to give away gospels or give away New Testaments. I mean, thank God for the ministry of the Gideons mm. who have so faithfully yes. over so many decades have placed them in hotels. And yeah, and we're working closely with them now over here now called The Good News for Everyone. That's right. And we had conversations over the last six months saying, you know, off the back of this statistic, how, in fact, we had an amazing roundtable conversation hosted by myself and others at the yes. EA, um, eight different organisations, all Bible literacy, Bible engagement organisations saying, off the back of this, how can we together, again, in unity and partnership, how can we work together to see the UK church actually excited again enough to be able to as individual Christians to say this Bible is transformative for people yes. how do we excite ourselves enough to be saying just as your friend did how can I get the gospel into people's hands yes. um, but also for those out there who are seeking and, and will search out the 22% who'll go to the Bible first Absolutely. how can we make it available accessible attractive I know. appropriate and out in places that they I mean, can easily access and it. we need to be more intentional about it I mean l last week um, I was at my cousin's funeral and uh, met lots of other cousins who I haven't seen for a long long time and um, I, we, I messaged several of them that evening after the funeral and many of them have shown receptivity. Mm -hmm. And to one of them, I said, look, uh, start reading John's gospel and just read one chapter a day. And she replied, I will. Yeah. I think sometimes yeah. we're hesitant, Absolutely. but actually yeah. just suggest it. Yes, yeah. And that might create yeah. curiosity. Yeah. And I've challenged myself even recently to do exactly that, to think people are receptive. One of the statistics that comes out in here, which really bulldoze us in a really positive, encouraging way, was that we, we asked non-Christians, if you've had a conversation, just like you and your cousin, if you've had a conversation with a Christian recently, would you be willing Willing to go again and to explore things deeper and one in three people across the UK said yes so that's really encouraging in and of itself isn't it it makes it even totally. more stark that actually if we look at that statistic that question back in 2015 it was one in five yeah. so it shows us that in this seven years of all the unrest and the trauma of Covid and the threat of war and the cost of living crisis people are more and more open and receptive, yeah. it seems, to exactly those kind of conversations. And if we prompt those bravely, a bit more boldly, and I'm certainly challenging, have challenged myself even more over the last few months to think, what's the worst that can happen? Yes, you know? absolutely. <laughs> to enter into conversations. And actually, what I decided to do um, at Christmas time was actually buy a number of Mark's Gospels, John's Gospels, yes. and just put them in the gift bags with Absolutely. people's Christmas presents to think, well, they may just stick it on a shelf, but if they don't and they've got it, but then you who never knows know. how God and his spirit can just uplift the words on the page and it just impacts people's lives, doesn't it? So. Definitely. Okay, what do people think of Christians? Well, that was fascinating what came out because I'm sure, I don't know what you think, but it seems that the world over and certainly in the UK, the media portrays us as yes. incredibly negative, yes. bo uh, boring, dull people, rule abiding and all just altogether negative. Um, and certainly the headlines even around the census coming out was about Christianity being in decline, wasn't it, for the first time in uh, 50 years or sort of dropping below the 50%, the, uh, which wasn't a surprise to us because it tallied up with this. What came out of the research here when we asked people, if you know a practicing Christian, what is it that you think of them? We yes. found that it was resoundingly positive. 
which is really encouraging, hopefully should make us all sit up. So the um, adjectives that they picked out during the report said um, that overridingly they would describe the Christian individual that they know as friendly, as good-humoured, as kind and as generous. Those were the top four. Interesting. So really interesting. Um, but we went on to ask them about their reflections on the church and what came out was not quite as positive. No. So it came out that their reflections on the church as an institution or however they view it, actually the top answers were 26% of people said they felt the church could be narrow-minded and they felt that the church could be hypocritical, but it could also be friendly and caring and so on. So it wasn't all bad news, but going back to your question, what comes out overridingly is that where our non-Christian friends know us, and 53% of people say that they know a practising Christian, but where they know us, they know us really well, because we're actually a friend or a family member, that too came out. But where they know us, we're in close proximity and they really like us. So actually, hopefully, that should make all of us, like me as well, sit up to think, OK, again, what's the worst that can happen? We're in relationship, we're in close proximity and it's a great starting point for an open conversation, Absolutely. isn't it, about spirituality or faith because people are open. As we said, those one in three are asking the big questions and they like us, so it's a good starting point. It is a great starting point. Rachel, why do you think the media portrays Christians in a negative way? It's a very good question, isn't it? It's very limiting for us, in a sense, and I do wonder whether that's part of it, that there's a spiritual sense, a sure. human sense to be quashing the truth of the gospel, which actually, as we know, it's not a tame gospel, no. is it? It no. challenges life, it challenges it our lifestyle, um, it challenges leadership at every sector of society and community as well. Um, so I've got to believe that I think it's a spiritual thing. And as a church yeah. community, as individual Christians, and certainly as part of my work at the EA and working with churches and with individual Christians, you know, we'd really love to see churches and organisations become um, places that have a culture of evangelism that releases us within yes. our context to be that bit bolder and braver. But even more than that for us as individuals to challenge ourselves to be able to speak into these contexts because otherwise it can be crushing, but we know the freedoms that we have to be able to speak and of Jesus in the places where we find ourselves. So uh, when you first read the report, mm -hmm. when you got all the stats and analysed them, uh, what surprised you most about the research? Hmm. Um, a few things. I think one of the things that surprised me and challenged me the most was when we asked a number of questions about our fellow practising Christians. So we found out that people feel very confident, it seems, um, so they tell us through the survey, about um, sharing faith, how we know it's part of our job role. Um, so 75% of people, for example, said that they knew that within the Great Commission and so on, part of our role as Christians is to be sharing Jesus with those around us. What surprised me um, was not that people fear the big questions, because in conversations that sometimes happens, doesn't it? Understandably. But 42% of Christians said that they found that they didn't feel that they knew non-Christians well enough or they didn't know enough non-Christians to be sharing Jesus with them. That, to me, kind of felt like a big alarm bell, really. Of course. Of the fact that actually we maybe don't inhabit the spaces where we're alongside non-Christians. And if that's the case, then how are we going to expect that people come to know Jesus? So there was a big challenge for me around that of actually we can get so busy within our ministry lives, can't we, in our church lives and all great stuff. But actually, if we're wanting to be intentional about people finding Jesus, and I say that for me, that means in the everyday looking at where you already are, you know, whether it's the workplace, two with your neighbours, the school gates, the gym, the pub, the cafe, you know, having those intentional conversations with people who are already alongside us. But if we're not there, how will they ever know? Not only that we're not a practising Christian, but how will they know um, about Jesus? So that, for me, was one of the, the sure. big challenges, really, to inhabit spaces that we actually make ourselves known as Christian, so that when there are challenges, and many of my friends have been, or people that I know have been through, really difficult challenges this year, it seems, and a reeling. And in the midst of that, people ask big questions, don't they? So we Absolutely. need to be there and, and ready to just have genuine, normal conversations with them that go that little bit deeper, maybe. But that, that word, you mentioned a word, intentionality. And that's the thing, isn't it? It's being intentional about it. Each day, 
cultivating the web of relationships that we've already got. And, and, and I mean, I, when it comes to evangelism, I just say we've got to do three things. We've got to be intentional in praying, caring, sharing. That's it, Absolutely. really, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And as I've said to many um, churches or organisations that I've spoken to about this report is actually none of it's rocket science. And, but isn't it a timely reminder to us that actually we need to do exactly that, just to be great friends to people, to be alongside, to be, you know, to try and live lives of honesty and with integrity and holiness and seeking after God's character, but actually just being very real about the grime, the mess, you know, the, the muck of life that, that comes out, because that authenticity of doing life alongside people, I think is where so often people who can align ourselves, sorry, themselves with us, they see us in the real, but then they really watch and see how faith and life intermingle, don't they? Um, and how it really counts, actually, particularly in the situations of life crisis or pain or trauma, of which, sadly, there seems so much still today. Um, but people are so open, as we said, and the praying, caring, sharing is yeah. powerful, really powerful. So you're encouraged. I am encouraged. I'm deeply challenged as well, because what comes out of the report is great encouragement, but equally lots of challenge, challenge. which is good. Otherwise, we'd pat ourselves on the back, wouldn't we, and think, you know, everything is rosy. But I think what it encourages me and, and hopefully others is to recognise the opportunities that are there, how open people are, but equally how searching people are looking for light and truth and hope in the midst of sometimes clouded situations. Um, and so the challenge to myself and to others is actually, yeah, how can we be that great friend, be alongside, um, but to be intentional in those spaces as well, to share Jesus where we're able. Where can people get this report from, Rachel? The, the report is free to download. It's all simply on talkingjesus.org. Yeah, we'd love people to access it, pour over it. You can study it in small groups. Um, there are loads of resources on there as well. We've wanted this big picture national research to drop down into local church context to really fuel conversations around evangelism, to equip individuals to feel released into not being what they might think an evangelist is, but into their own personal witness of day-to-day -day evangelism. Um, we've produced a personal workbook that people can work through in their small groups. Um, there's an evangelist evangelism health check for a local church to be able to, as a church community, look at where they're at now in terms of faith sharing, where they'd like to be and journey towards that. So talkingjesus.org has got lots of resources, which we hope and pray will serve the local church for the years to come. Well, thanks for doing this research, Rachel, with your colleagues and the Evangelical Alliance. It's, it really is so helpful. Um, and as you say, encouraging and challenging. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have this conversation with you. Thanks so much. Really enjoyed speaking with you, J. John. Thank you. I love talking to Rachel and uh, I have found this report research so helpful. Um, I've actually not just read it uh, many, many times. I've actually studied it. And as Rachel said, those two words come out. It's encouraging and we need to be encouraged, but it's challenging. Now, if you're a church leader, you haven't read this, can I urge you to do so? Rachel said there are many resources. Well, why don't you look at those resources and see if you can uh, look at them as a church or in your small groups uh, to be encouraged, but also to respond to the challenges. Thank you very much for joining us. Please join us again.